parents would only give me $20 a week. 30x youngest intern there and the, uh, my other interns were like Stanford and Harvard MBA. Okay, so hello everyone, welcome to an exclusive edition of Vivi's Talk. Today we break new ground as we present the first of its kind feature interview with a figure who has intrigued the creepy world with his remarkable journey from skeptic to believer, from a teen to the venture capitalist, Sharvin. Awesome. Thank you for coming, Sharvin. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, so could you please just uh, share with them about your experience into the creepy world? Sure. Mm -hmm. So I kind of started trading at the age of 14, mainly commodities and pharmaceutical stocks because my parents would only give me $20 a week while other kids would get more. And I wanted to spend a lot of money and I needed money for that. Mm -hmm. So I started getting like a quick $500 loan from my dad. Um, and then I started using it on this platform called eToro under his name. And then I just was lever trading a lot on different oil stocks and I kind of made more than 30x or mm -hmm. something in the first few months and I returned my dad his original capital back so I was just doing a bit of trading here and there like mainly trading the same era of stocks uh, for like the next two three years and then afterwards in 2016 came across crypto and yeah I, I mean you know, with Bitcoin and everything, when it first time hit the CNBC mm -hmm. and mainstream head uh, news companies, I was like a bit, you know, skeptical. Like, what is this magic money mm -hmm. <laughs> that is just shooting up in value? Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to a lot of people back then, I think all of them were basically just saying cryptocurrencies are money that will replace your traditional currencies. And I do not buy that concept back then and even today. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, Bitcoin and Ethereum and like people basically wanted to use it as currency and and I thought that was absolutely ridiculous actually. <laughs> um, and then I think I was just shorting crypto all the way. Like I was so into like I was so convicted into shorting crypto that throughout the 2017 bull market I was actually still shorting and potentially losing money but I was always topping up. And I even made the efforts to go to different OTC shops, right, because back then you could not short mm -hmm. crypto because there was no perpetuals. And I went to yeah. different OTC shops and for until 2018, I you know, maintained mm -hmm. my shorts until I made money. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, pretty happy. You know, crypto is maybe dead. <laughs> and you were only 18 years old? Uh, uh, 17. Oh, 17. Oh my God. When I did mm -hmm. that. Um, actually 16 and a half when I first discovered crypto and started shorting after my 17th birthday. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I met like a DeFi team um, back in 20, basically 2018, a few months after I made money from shorts. Uh, and they were like one of, their, I think, one of the OG pioneers in the industry, um, mainly for perpetuals because I love trading back then. And they actually explained to me what the meaning of on-chain, why should things be on-chain, what is smart contracts, and you know why this is great. And that basically was that was it like that is what got me first the positive on crypto or, or smart contracts in general because i think the smart contract is the alpha not the uh independent currency mm -hmm. like applications basically mm -hmm. and then kind of invest in the seed round and i think they're one of the top six even today um perpetual uh indexes out there mm -hmm. and after that you know eventually you get added into different groups and stuff with other ogs and you just get more deal flow and then you start you know trading more mm. and doing more angel investments and yeah that's how i kind of got my uh, start into crypto yeah so being a venture capitalist is not your first choice but because of experience fun fact i was actually mm -hmm. doing a, a quick internship actually back then because you know i was 17 so um. i wanted to get in out in the world early mm -hmm. uh, it was with this company called tribe it was like a fintech VC fund in mm -hmm. Singapore founded by the former Nasdaq CEO mm -hmm. and I was like the youngest intern there and the, uh, my other interns were like Stanford and Harvard MBA wow. and then yeah that's so alongside the crypto shots this was my daytime thing mm. and of course school mm -mm. yeah I see I see so behind the uh, decisions making what is the core between uh, being behind yourself in your heart is that making you driving you into that mm -hmm. um, but 
crypto as an asset class is quite early and mm -hmm. as an investor I want to see returns you know and obviously that there is a huge factor and apart from that you can't only be you know money minded because if you're just money minded you're probably just going to be you know just be a normal hedge fund um, mm. and that's not going to help you with anything like if you want to make a difference right so when i saw DeFi, i think DeFi was the one that actually touched my heart quite a bit so i think you know when i first uh invest in like the perpetual decks mm -hmm. um back in 2018 like that was DeFi, and i didn't even know MakerDAO existed back then like I, I mean, there was MakerDAO, but it was not so, you know, famous. Mm -hmm. And I was like so, such a newbie back then. And I just managed to stumble across this opportunity. But why DeFi is mainly because real time, um, transparency, and, you know, most important, I think, for DeFi is composability. Like, you know, Lego blocks, you can connect everything to everything permissionlessly. Mm -hmm. that, that part was very interesting, which later got me to you know, build, uh, be part of like the core team that built um, one of the largest on-chain DEXs, uh, all the books actually, on Solana. Um, yeah, that, that was pretty much a very rewarding journey where we were doing like um, every day, like 1.3 bill in daily volume, something like that. And yeah, it was, that, that was a pretty amazing journey. And you know, like you could actually see the power of DeFi and composability mm. back then. I see, I see. So like your past cannot mm. be copied. So um, do you have some advice for the individuals, especially for the youth? How can they make the right decision making when they need to, uh, to do that? Mm, I, I guess it comes down to, you know, what drives your core motivation. Mm. Like why I got started with trading is, you know, my parents were giving me $20 a week, mm. which was yeah. You know, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just yeah. just like lunch at school, and that's mm -hmm. it. And I can't spend it on different snacks like my friend uses to. So like, it depends on what, where your core motivation comes from. Like, mm -hmm. and then if you wanna really, you know, make it in crypto, I think um, it is much more easier to make it in crypto relative to TradFi. Not because crypto is easy, mm -hmm. but rather because crypto is more open and transparent. Like, which other industry allows you allows anyone to basically participate in discussions of a protocol's governance other than crypto like you can just go onto discord or you can go to one of the MakerDAO's forum and you can mm -hmm. write a proposal if people like it they will follow it mm -hmm. and you know that that was a pretty interesting way to allow people to participate in everything yeah to have such like a individual sovereign mm. in this kind of industry yes I see I see so let's now get into the heart of the matter uh, Charmin, you've seen the trends rise and fall, especially in the finance, in the fintech. So, uh, and with this on capital, you are at the forefront of Web 3's evolution. So, what's happening right now in these dynamic spaces, and what aspects of Web 3 development does this on capital prioritize? Awesome. Yeah. Um, maybe before I go into like what interests this on, and I think this will be. Uh, quite helpful for people to understand why I'm going to say the sectors we are interested in. So Saison Capital is basically like the investment arm of a large Japanese financial institution that's more than 70 years old and has a lot of, um, you know, like has been in the game for a long time, mm -hmm. since, like since the World War II era. And we also like the, one of the largest credit card companies in the, uh, Japan and also one of the largest wholesale lenders in obviously Japan and Southeast Asia. So we lend out to different lenders, non-banking lenders, <coughs> banks, and quite a few tech unicorn companies. Like for example, one of the exa public examples I can give is Grab, for example, is one of Saison's early stage investments as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, for us, in the early stages, we obviously look for founders trying to create, uh, founders trying to basically solve the best problems out there. Mm. And you know, um, figure out if they actually have the execution ability. And for Grab, we saw that, invested in it, like back in the day. And then <coughs> as they kind of got to the product market fit, like where maybe Grab was in 2019, mm -hmm. um, we also kind of helped Grab create this thing called Grab Financial. Uh -huh. Grab Financial is basically a few billion dollar subsidiary yeah, for Grab. Yeah, very essential part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was also something Saison did. And we have done similar stuff for other notable um, companies in the region and India. 
Mm. Yeah. I see, I see. And mm -hmm. so to go back to the question, yes. um, which sectors we are interested in, of course, the most closest sector to my heart, which is DeFi, mm. um, because DeFi is one, and in DeFi, what we are keen on is mainly uh, uh, stable coins, a bit of money market protocols, um, order books for sure. But for order books, we're only going to be focused on fast chains because uh, order book on Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism is kind of useless. Like it kind of defeats the whole purpose because it's not going to work out mm. um, because of the underlying technology of those e EVM layer twos, I guess. Mm. Um, and then we also focus a bit on, so we obviously love ZK, um, mm. but what we are not big fans of now mm. are ZK rollups because there's no need. Like for example, most of the ZK rollups that we have right now, they don't even have ZK in the technology uh, and, yeah, it is. and they raise mm. what, a few hundred millions to do what? And then now they're kind of outsourcing mm. to different protocols, which is Mm. A bit weird, and at the same time, it does not help or enhance any form of user experience. In fact, I think it makes life really tough for the developers. Like, for one example, is I can't share the name of the layer two, mm. um, but it's a zk rollup, um, and so they basically that foundation of that rollup basically gives money to people just to build on them, mm. but the team has zero idea about what smart contracts of that chain are which um. pill, which is very scary for me because mm. like i understand now you got a free comfy you know helpful whenever the foundation will just come and help you do smart contracts and the team just focuses on ux and ui which is i think frankly anyone can do um and when the time arises where you know security issues mm -hmm. come up like yeah, they're not going to have time for everyone. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's common that we saw some projects, especially when you mentioned about ZK Rollups, they sometimes just get a principle and people would like to, to buy in a, about the principle but not the technology itself. Mm. So this um, becomes a main problem. 100%. Yeah, exactly. Exist and the other issue is, you know, this is probably like another answer that's going to explain why I do not like EVM stacks mm. is if you look at all the different proposals like EIP 4244, 4488, for example, like imagine like you have Ethereum here and then you have another ZK rollup here. This, the Ethereum can only pass 700 transactions to overall. Mm. So now that we see a trend or rather people talking about uh, there's going to be a few thousand roll-ups, right? Yeah. So you're basically dividing 700 by, you know, oh. so what's the TPS going to be? 0.1? Um, yeah, that's not realistic in any way. And on top of that, the finality is still really bad and it's just going to end up being what Ethereum is, you know? Like, Ethereum is just a clogged up network. Like, I think Vitalik once really said this, right? When he was going for... Uh, B Bitcoin stuff, right? <coughs> Back in 2017, I, if I recall the tweet, he basically said any transaction that does not, you know, um, get finalized in the next few seconds, it's a liveness failure. Y you realize how big of an issue that is? Um, because liveness failure is something people accuse other chains, of, like Ethereum accuses other chains of, and how long does it take for Ethereum? <laughs> like 12 minutes for time to finality and ZK rollups even worse actually like I remember during ZK one of the ZK chains testnet they did a simple testnet transaction of $10 it took 48 hours to finalize mm, I agree with you quite ridiculous yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but we saw DeFi summer in the last mm. circle and for this new year we saw the inscriptions mm. are just uh, bombing out so we are all ears to hear what your thoughts on the inscriptions. Mm. I guess inscription is a great way for different blockchains to understand where they are mm -hmm. in terms of their ability to take in spam. Because the internet today, I think, has around 80% of all the searches going through the internet today 
are spams actually. They're not real searches. Um, so that is a reality we have to accept. Um, and I think inscription is just a great way to filter out which blockchains so far mm -hmm. did the best. But you know, product-wise, user experience-wise, nah, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a great, it made a great meme coin, I think, but I do not see any real use case for it. Like, yes, it can be inscribed, but you don't need Bitcoin for it. Mm. You can inscribe it on Solana, Aptos, or any chain that can be used, you know, like by my grandmother, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Maybe also to go back on the previous question, um, uh, is like the other sectors we are raking on is RWA as well. Um, and, mm. and because obviously Saison, our core business, what we do is, you know, we don't call it RWA because, well, that's what we do. Um, we are already in the real world, I guess. Um, so we already kind of invested in this company called Hel Hel Helix, which mm. is like the uh, subsidiary of uh, one of the leading uh, credit players in Singapore called Helicap. Mm. And Saison has been backing Helicap since many years now. Oh. And yeah, we were super happy to help them uh, create like a different crypto subsidiary but that is regulated very well and mm. has all the bank distribution agreements. And lastly is we also like privacy ZK, but not the ZK rollup, obviously, mm. uh, but privacy plug and play. For example, uh, there are these companies on Solana called Elusive, for example. It's quite simple, right? You just connect your wallet and that's it. You already got your privacy for just one cent. Mm. Yeah. And the transaction is also like maximum two seconds. Mm. Mm. So that's the kind of um, privacy that we are kind of keen to get interested in, but no ZK rollups. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I still remember that first we got to know each mm. other is in a, uh, in an event. And go back to that time you mentioned that you have a, a keen interest in Solana. So we've already witnessed Solana's impressive performance uh, in the market especially those months, mm. including a substantial rise recent days. So Solana increasingly recognized as, as a key player and a strong layer one alternative to Ethereum. So yep. how do you view and how do you evaluate Solana's current role in the cryptocurrency? Sure. So, I mean, for me, Solana has a very, very special place in my heart because obviously, like most people, I started off with Ethereum, but because Ethereum is so unusable, I wanted something fast. Mm. And thankfully, got uh, you know I got it. I, I found Solana, and I was also like one of the I invested pretty early in Solana, um, be mainly because the, what the team was trying to do back then was like quite unique because everyone else was just forking Ethereum. Mm, and why is that? Uh, that's quite 2018, 2019. Oh. Yeah, quite quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. Like uh, so, hence like Solana is like people like to say it's my first love. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, basically after that, um, why Solana? So obviously, I think during the collapse of FTX, um, I think Solana was around two fifty dollars, and obviously that was quite overvalued because, fun fact, is a few weeks ago, uh, the Dex volumes on Solana was actually triple that of Solana's peak in twenty twenty one, and the prices, you know, it it. It did not make sense, uh, like in the financial ratio wise, back in 2021. So, and obviously the FTX collapse, you know, triggered mm. the Solana price collapse. But that being said, it did not destroy Solana community, because, I mean, if you look at the stats during the bear market, for example, um, if you if you know Mad Lads, so before Mad Lads Mint came in, uh, our firm did like a research as well uh, on capital efficiency, right? So. You can have a trillion dollars if you want as TBL, but if you're just having trillion dollars sitting there doing nothing, it's kind of inefficient and it's called lazy capital. Mm. And it's kind of potentially like a slow cannibalism for the chain because they're just going to eventually hand out as a different form of emissions because they have nothing to do with the money. <laughs> um, so good for the users, <laughs> but um, you, you know, for the chain's economic, no, I don't think it's great. So we looked at Solana, and Solana ended up being the highest capital efficient chain even during the bear market. For example, 
Um, you know, a lot of people say that Solana has a lot of bots, and that's partially true. But just and the ability that they have transaction and spam bots is a great sign because you're, as I mentioned about the internet, right? You're going to have a lot of spams coming in sh for sure, mm. and you have the infrastructure to allow that. And then the next thing is um, people were able to use it. Like I get my grandmother to try out every crypto product oh. because my understanding is if she can use it, anyone, yeah, everyone can, can use it. Exactly. <laughs> so I allowed her, to, like I got her to use like different protocols, wallets, and you know, her answer was Solana. <laughs> <laughs> so she's also a fan for Solana. Oh, she didn't even know what the technology was. Like I just told her use this, use this, and she's like, mm -hmm. oh, this is easier. Okay. Oh, it's uh, user friendly. Yes, mm -hmm. for someone who's in her eighties. Mm. So you know that that's a pretty big statement. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the activity, right? So the, what I mean by capital efficiency is you have the TVL, and then you have the on-chain volume. So you basically divide the TVL to the on-chain volume on a 24-hour basis. Mm -hmm. So for Solana, it was around $1.80 or something per dollar of TVL. Mm -hmm. Whereas for other chains, it was every dollar of TVL was less than 40 cents, which is not capitally e efficient at all. Mm -hmm. And this was before Mad Lads, right? So which means that Solana has real organic users mm -hmm. who use the chain because they like the applications and they're not there to add uh, you know airdrop farm and like a lot of people if you check out the user statistics is they actually use tensor the nft marketplace mango markets or any zeta markets uh, any of the dexes right a lot of people actually have done more than 100 transactions in 24 hours in retail no mm. professionals mm. and you know that speaks a lot of volume actually about how easy it is to use a high throughput non EVM chain oh. and also about the so and then people speak about how Solana is centralized right which is such a big lie but because <laughs> um, I remember back in when I was you know talking good things about Solana uh, when I recently discovered them and People were basically telling me, oh, well, that is a very centralized blockchain. It's not even a blockchain. And, and those same people today, you know what they are using? They're using layer twos. And layer twos, there's nothing more centralized than layer twos because there's one sequence and mm. you know, like, that's a bit of an irony there. And to, to come and to talk about the numbers. So Solana's Nakamoto coefficient. So this metric talks about how how many validators will it take to bring down the network? Ethereum, guess the number. It's single digit. It's only two validators can bring it down. And that's really unsafe and centralized. Mm -hmm. And Solana is 36 right now, which is the highest of any blockchain. And obviously you have all the Web2 companies like Shopify, Visa, Master, everyone's coming into Solana right now. It's just an easy network to use. Mm -hmm. So it and the community. I don't know if you checked out Crypto Twitter for Solana, but even during the bear market, no one's hopes were down. They were all busy building and just trying to deliver the best product with security and the best user experience. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, yeah. So as you mentioned about mm. layer two. So my next question: Want to know more about uh, the layer two investments? In season capital, uh, is season capital considering investments in the layer two space? Mm, infrastructure or applications? Um, infrastructure. Infrastructure definitely no, because definitely no. Mm -hmm. our whole core thesis is we want to invest in for infrastructure. We want to invest in high throughput uh, blockchains mm -hmm. that are upgradable as well. So that you know, um, your speed increases as your users increase as well. So that's not there on any layer twos right now. But we have invested in a few applications on Base, mainly because of its strategic uh, alliance with Coinbase and the ability that you know it's aligned with uh, one of the most regulated players in the industry today. Mm -hmm. um, we thought, uh, and you know, obviously trying to get find more good builders there who are actually trying to make a difference with different uh, DeFi applications out there. And 
use the advantage of Coinbase and their network. But as with regards to other layer twos, um, we not super keen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Considering about scalability and yeah. user experience. Mm. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti layer two infrastructure. What I am against is building building on an infrastructure that is very weak mm. or congested. Mm -mm -mm. So, for example, if someone tells me. Um, okay, assuming like two years later, you know Solana, the layer one has so much traffic, it's unbearable. Like maybe 50 million people start using Solana, then obviously you need a layer two, right? On Solana, but Solana foundation is pretty rock solid. And there's obviously Aptos and Sui as well, right? Mm -hmm. And those technologies actually have a better foundation compared to EVM. Yeah. Mm, so it can actually take the load in, you know, like um, yeah, like for EVM, it's just hard to believe to take the, uh, all the transactions in. I see, I see. Mm. Okay, so uh, it's already 2024. Mm. So let's looking ahead to 2024. Are there any specific areas or trends in the Web3 industry that you find particularly promising yourself? Mm, myself? Mm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Recognize it as a significant. Mm. Obviously, like, we will always be super keen on the institutional DeFi. Mm. So maybe, okay, let me not call it institutional DeFi. Let me call it on-chain finance. On -chain because, finance. you know, the decentralized part is obviously missing when institutions come in. Yeah, I still remember that. Is JP Morgan read an article and mentioned and created about institutional DeFi. Is that right? Um, so there's many ways to go around it, right? So for us, we are going to be mainly focused because Cezanne's core business is wholesale lending, so mm. cheap loans, which creates a lot of different credit businesses. Um, oh. So we are going to be focused on what we you know, spoke about, basically RWA credit. Mm. That's something we have really high conviction on, and we have already made all the bets that we think may uh, you know, fly in 2024 and beyond. We've already made it in the last two years, with like more than 40 companies. So we are basically hands down helping all of our portfolio companies in that respect uh, to get them the right regulatory partner, get them the right uh, commercial web traditional TradFi partner and all sorts of things, you know, basically help them get the benefits of a TradFi brand. I see. So um, did you already make some investments on RWA? RWA mm. is not a new um, idea, yes, um, but most people think that still have a long way to go. So they don't think that 2024 is the uh, is the best uh, year for RWA because it has so many uncertainties. Oh, for sure. I yeah. I definitely remember the uh, the era of you know 2017 yeah. where every everything can be tokenized. Yes. Um, but the difference there was um, it was not done right, and it was done pretty much for a quick rug, mm. you know, like most of those guys were not sincere in what they were actually building. And and as the thesis was correct, you know, you, you can no longer see them around because they're missing with the money. Mm -hmm. um, but this time we see more sophisticated regulated players like Helicap coming in. Like Helicap has multiple MAS licenses and they have been in business for a very long time and have hired like a different team, full different team just to focus on crypto and we are seeing this with not only a non-banking player like this we are also see bank of america goldman sachs all of them basically hiring 10 different people just to focus on crypto right now and a lot of them are actually using avax uh, mm. avax subnets like it's a very unknown fact that actually since november 2022 a lot of these top six top ten global in, uh, banks in the world, like mainly American banks, are using AVAX. Oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the trend has already started because, and they're not doing small vo volumes, they're doing like two, three billion dollars a day, which is pretty significant, you know? Mm. And they have obviously, you know, since, I mean, I think it's really good that we are at, on the AVAX subnet, but I think 
it's very good because back in 2016, 17, they were not even considering subnets. They were considering private blockchains. Mm. Mm. So that is bad, obviously. Mm. Um, and then for these guys, um, they are considering uh, potentially integrating their subnets with other public blockchains. Mm. Which is really like, um, unfortunately, like people can't really share the details of that, you know, because the institutions want to keep it really secretive. But behind the scenes, there's a lot of uh, things going on. Yeah, I can, I can feel. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Sharvin, yeah, this is my last question. Mm. So, considering your early success, what are your future career goals? What's mm. the next step about your future goals? I mean, my goal has always been the same since 2018. Mm -hmm. It's basically trying to be able to find the best next thing. You know, that's all I'm looking for all the time. And especially if it helps with financial applications, that's where my main focus is so far. And yeah, like, is basically trying to continue what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but you know, improve along the way. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, who in the business world would you look up to as a role model? In the business world, um, I think Mark Zuckerberg is a really great example. He's, I think, one of the only founders of a major tech company that was not fired from his own company. <laughs> <laughs> And at the same time, he kept on his promises to deliver the products, right? Even, even if the products did not get the successful metrics, he still delivered what he promised to his shareholders. And at the same time, he you know, pretty much picked up a simple idea and just managed to make a way to you know, make it really revolutionary. And it was pretty revolutionary, right? Like back when Facebook started, like I think for me, like when my father and mom, started, my dad and mom used to start using Facebook and I remember begging them to open an account for me because mm -hmm. it felt so cool and it really connected the world, right? So I, I think he's like one of the best role models for, in my life for me. Okay, okay. <laughs> so thank you, Shavi, for coming and this is a wonderful interview I've never had. Thank you so much for thank coming, Shavi. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.